This week's message, given by Pastor Stephen Yun at the Sarkasani United Methodist Church, May 2nd, 2021. The message is how to keep criticism from snuffing out hope, based on Job 6, 8-23 and 2 Corinthians 4, 7-9. Today's Old Testament reading is from Job 6, 8 to 23. Oh that, um, oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me, to let loose his hand and cut off my life. Then I would still have this consolation, my joy in unrelenting pain, that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. What strength do I have that I should still hope what prospects that I should be patient? Do I have the strength of stone? Is my flesh bronze? Do I have any power to help myself now that success has driven from me, has been driven from me? Anyone who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. But my brothers are as undependable as intermittent streams, as the streams that overflow when darkened by thawing ice and swollen with melting snow, but that stopped flowing in the dry season and in the heat vanished from their channels. Caravans turn aside from their roots. They go f off into the wasteland and perish. The caravans of Tima look for water. The traveling merchants of Sheba look in hope. They are distressed because they had been confident. They arrive there only to be disappointed. Now you too have proved to be of no help. You see something dreadful and are afraid. Have I ever said, give something on my behalf? Pay a ransom for me from your wealth? Deliver me from the hand of the enemy? Rescue me from the clutches of the ruthless? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7-9. But we have this treasure in jaws of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It's good to be with you this morning. Would you join me as I pray? O oh God, we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come in this place to be with us. Open our hearts and minds to the words of Scripture so that we can discern your will, understand your path for our lives. Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten our hearts so that we become more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. While shaking hands with the pastor after the worship, one parishioner noticed that the pastor had a bad cut on his face. Why, pastor, what happened? How did you cut your face? He asked, well, I was thinking about my sermon this morning, while I was shaving, the pastor replied, I guess I wasn't concentrating and cut myself in the process. That's too bad, he replied. Well, next time, pastor, you should concentrate on your shaving and cut your sermon. <laughs> well, actually, I cut my sermon today, uh, realizing that we have a communion. So today's sermon is going to be a little shorter than normal. Beginning this Sunday, we're engaging in a new sermon series called Didn't See It Coming, which is based on Carrie Newup's book. This sermon series is about some of the significant challenges no one expects and everyone experiences. We are going to focus on three challenges that are more relevant to us in today's world. There's cynicism, burnout, and disconnection. 
I'm sure no one dreams about becoming cynical, burned out, or disconnected. We may not see them coming in our lives, but it actually happens to us at some point of our life. We have gotten through this COVID pandemic over a year by now. We see the signs of cynicism, burnout, and disconnection in our own life and the lives of uh, others around us. So how do, we, how do we as Christians respond to them in faith? What it means to, to identify them and respond to them in faith? How could we overcome these challenges as a Christians? So we could not only survive, but thrive as Christians, as disciples of Christ? And these are the, some of the questions that we are going to tackle in this sermon series. And my prayer is that, that God may open the eyes of our heart so we can discern our hearts minds before God and have greater understanding of ourselves. So this morning, I'd like us to think about cynicism, what it does to us, and how we can keep cynicism from snuffing out our hope. As we begin, think of the person, the most cynical person you have ever met or, or, have, or known in your life can be your family member, your, one of your friends, your co-worker. You can also include yourself if you think you are the most cynical person you know. Who are the cynics? Who are they as a person and what do you know about them? About this um, from our kitchen. What do you see here? What do you see here? Anybody? Yeah? Well, people use this to explain the difference between the abundance attitude mindset or scarcity mindset, or as an example of optimist versus pessimist. If you're an optimist, you would say half full, right? What about pessimist? If you're a pessimist, pessimist would say half empty, right? There can be more responses, though. If you are a realist, you would simply say a glass of water. If you were a physicist, we have a scientist here, but if you're a physicist, you would say half gas, half liquid, made with H2O, right? If you were a skeptic, how would you say? What would you say? I don't know if it's really a water, right? What about cynic? How would cynic see this? A cynic would say it's a bad, corrupted water, if it's, if, if it's really water, right? Some people use cynicism as a synonym for skepticism. They might sound similar, but they're not the same. Cynicism is about being distrustful of human nature and motives and distrustful of the world that we live in. It's an attitude that assumes the worst, the out of the people and the world. In today's Old Testament lesson, we reread the story of Job. In the face of the unspeakable, devastating tragedy, Job wants to figure out why he has to suffer and, and where God is in all that. As Job was grieving, searching for a reason, his three friends come to comfort him but ends up judging and criticizing Job, who claims himself to be innocent. These three friend, friends cover many topics, many theological issues. But to put it simply, Eliphaz, one of the Job's friends, is saying something like this. Job, think who that was innocent 
ever perished. You are suffering only because of what you've done before God. So let's figure out what you've done to deserve it. That's what this friend say throughout this story. Another friend, Billet, says, if you are pure, I'm right, God would answer you with prosperity. You've got suffering, you must be your own fault. But if you are in a right relationship with God, God will heal you for sure. That's what his friend Bildad would say. Lastly, Jophar, another friend, criticized Job for questioning God, saying, how dare you ask such a question? Why would God take the trouble to explain himself to a mortal creature like you? It's just God's will. You, just, you will just have to accept it. Well, what terrible things to say to a friend in suffering. Imagine Job hearing his friends speak these words. In verse 14, Job says, When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends at least should stick with them. But my brothers are fickle as a gulch in the desert. One day they are gushing with water from melting ice and snowing cascading out of the mountains, but by midsummer they are dry. Job uses an interesting image here to describe his friends. Job uses this image of gulch or brook which refers to a wadi, to use the modern Arab expression. These watercourses are characteristics of the Palestine region. During the month, winter month, they are often forming rivers. There will be a lot of waters, but in the hot summer, when they would be of priceless values, they become dry. And this is how Job experiences his friends as being as unreliable as a wadi that vanishes when it is hot, when it is most needed. That's how Job feels about his friends. So these words express his profound sense of disappointment, betrayal, hurt that he experienced from his friends. Job is seeking to search for an answer and find a meaning. That, and that's what we do, friends. In the aftermath of the tragedy, we try to make sense. We try to find meaning. We try to try to find the meaning. We try to make sense what we are going through, and it becomes part of our healing process. In this meaning making, meaning finding process, Christians are the one that know the redemptive power of the community. The Christians are the one who experience the friendship and the fellowship of the community that provides a holding environment, the environment where they're supported, empowered to name their experiences and affirmed that they are not alone. However, when this holding community, holding community is not present and is not considered a source of support, people might be left the struggle with betrayal and confusion on their own. One of the most pointed definitions of cynicism I found is from Lisa Firestone, clinical psychologist and author. She views cynicism as part of a defensive posture we take to protect ourselves. It's typically triggered when we feel hurt or, bet or betrayed by others feel angry repeatedly at something. It's kind of a shield we put on to defend, protect ourselves. What happened is that instead of dealing with those painful emotions directly, we allow them to faster secure our outlook. So it's, a, it's our response to a deep sense of disappointment, hurt, frustration, disappointment toward others, the world, and even God. Based on this understanding of cynicism, do you think Job would be considered one of the cynics? 
What do you think? I don't think we can say that since Job is in the process of active grief. What we can say based on this text is, though, that cynicism is growing in his heart because of the heart disappointment he experienced from his friends. Perhaps not to the extent of Job's case, I believe we all have been there, a place of disappointment, a place of hurt, a place of distrust. As we live through all the seasons of life, we come to discover that cynicism is not just something other people experience, but something we sense growing within us. In his book, Carrie Newoff talks about three signs that you grow cynical. The first sign is that you feel that you know it all. You feel that you know it all. You know everything. I'm sure you heard people saying these words, perhaps yourself. I have been there, but I've done that, but I can explain that in 10 seconds if you let me sort of tendency that comes with having a lived a while. What you hear is defensiveness and closedness here. Now you know too much. You've experienced that already. You experienced the heartbreak, betrayal, backstabbing. You experience how even a close friend of yours can let you down. You've experienced that some people take advantage of your good intention. You've seen that some people cannot be trusted. The longer you live, the more you know. And this is why the, Sol the King Solomon linked more knowledge with more grief. Because the more you know, the more you see life what really is. When you grow cynical, you feel that you know it all. It means you close yourself to a new reality, new experience. The second sign of becoming more cynical is that you project the past into the future. You project the past into the future. Think about this. As a human, each of us is a storyteller. We tell stories not only through our mouth, but also through our lives. And the, this, the, sor the sources of the storytelling are two, the past stories and the future stories. Our present storytelling is shaped by these two different sources, two stories, future and past stories. We all have past stories that contain our lived experience. We all have future stories that contain imagined future. Imagine situation. What if I get sick? What if I get the virus? What if I lose my job? What if my marriage falls apart? What cynicism does is to overshadow our future with the past. To overshadow the future stories with the past stories, especially with the negative ones. In verse 10, after hearing his friend's harsh, insensitive words, Job raises these two questions, rhetorical questions. Where is the strength to keep my hopes up? What future do I have to keep me going? As cynicism, cynicism grows within his heart, Job starts questioning about his future. Friends, if you could t recall a time when you got hurt, betrayed by someone, how many of you have thought that you never trust someone, anyone again? Cynicism wells up inside you when you experience the heartbreaks, when you see people make the same mistake, the same uh, problematic behavior over and over again. And it affects you and others in, in, in relationships, especially new relationships that would develop. What happens with cynicism growing inside you is that you project your past failures, your past pain of disappointment, your past hurt into the future. In a sense, your past pain becomes your future hurt. If 
you let cynicism control your heart. Finally, the third sign is that you decide to stop trusting, stop believing, stop hoping. In his book, Newoff points out that the problem with cynicism is that, quote, you no longer see people for who they are. You no longer see situations for what they could be. You just see potential hurt. This stands affect your present. This stands affect your present stories. When cynicism wells up inside you, you have greater difficulty trusting others. Of course, life isn't easy. We see the dark, broken sides of humanity all the time. Acts of exploitation, abuse, scheming, manipulation. And we've got to be aware of those. We've got to be alert to them. There's a healthy sense of suspicion, the protective qualities of it. And we need it for sure. But what cynicism leads us to do is to work hard to avoid harm and, and close ourselves up to people. But un unfortunately, you do so to the disadvantage of yourself. In your effort to avoid getting hurt, you mistrust even those who want to be friendly and supportive toward you. You exhaust yourself by constantly trying to stay on guard. The problem with cynicism is that when we grow cynical toward one thing in our lives, we may slowly start to turn on everything. As you find yourself trusting less, stop hoping, it affects your spiritual relationship with, with God as well. You become less clear about the purpose of praying, the point of praying. Why? Because you feel like you're praying for things that won't happen or will, not, will happen anyway. So why bother? The very act of hardening your heart to people simply hardens your heart and your relationship with God and others. I just talked about three signs of cynicism that you become more cynical. If any part of you is growing cynical, friends, think about it. What is it? If any part of you is growing cynical at this point of your life, what is it? Do you find yourself becoming more cynical as you are going through, getting through this pandemic? Do you see all that is happening in our lives? Politics? I invite you to discern your heart and pray about it today and throughout this week. Friends, if you see cynicism growing within you, I, wanna, I want you to understand that this is, by the way, the insight from the uh, new off. Cynicism happens not because you are closed, because you are open once. Cynicism begin, begins not because you don't care, but because you do care. It starts because you pour your heart into something and got little in return. Maybe you got something in return, but it was the opposite of what you desired. We have to face the truth that it is still a decision. It's a decision you make, though it may not always be a conscious decision. It's the decision you make to stop hoping, trusting, and believing. And its final outcome is the loss of hope. The hope that the future will be different and better than the present, the past. The hope that God will make things new. The hope that God will grant us new reality, a new future. You know, the Apostle Paul truly believed in this truth. And he shares it with the Christians in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians, Janet Fishline read this morning. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, 
but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. As Paul teaches here, we may be pressed by the circumstances, the relationship, the hurting relationship we experience, but not crushed, not perplexed, not in despair, not in cynicism. Christians resist cynicism not because we are naive optimists. We know our dark sides, the brokenness of our world, but we also know that our hope is anchored in the character of God who loves us abundantly. Our hope is anchored in the purpose of God who can be trusted in all circumstances. When darkness comes and seems to veil what God is doing among us, in our world, we may encounter cynic inside of us. But we don't have to stay a cynic. We shouldn't stay a cynic because of what God did through Jesus Christ, as we thought about it through a sermon series, Love Has Already Won. Our response should not be pessimism or cynicism, but confidence in God. What God can do and what God will do in the future for us. So friends, if you want to overcome cynicism, trust again, hope again, and believe again. As you see cynicism growing in your heart, continue to anchor your hope in who our God is. Anchor your hope in what God will do in your life. Amen.